Um, in the meantime, I'm excited that um, you're all here and that I have the opportunity to give this talk today. Um, this is actually a talk that I've given once before at Fort Garland. And it's some new ideas that I've been playing with. Um, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to um, revisit too many of the ideas, but it's nice to have this opportunity to talk through some of what's been going on at Fort Garland and kind of some of the archaeological research questions that the um, history and material culture there can answer. I think there is a video floating around of the talk from last year, which was last May. Um, and if you can find that, um, it was actually a lot of fun because Dr. Richard Goddard, who is one of the archaeologists who's um, done a lot of recent work at the fort, um, was in attendance with some of the students. And so he came up and was really able to share some fun stories and anecdotes, um, as well as kind of give his perspectives about the archaeology and some of what he was finding. So. Um, it was a really nice informal conversation that we were able to have with Dick and with the other folks at Fort Garland. So um, a, a little less formal than what we're going to see today. So uh, it might be worth your time if you're interested in this topic. I'm also going to go ahead for the sake of, oh, I'm going to go for the sake of, um, not being distracting, I'm going to stop my video for the talk. I do also want to warn um, anybody who may be especially sensitive to this that we will have um, one picture of human remains and that will actually be on the next slide. Um, they're not native or indigenous human remains, but they're human remains nonetheless, so um, please be aware of that. Um, first, I'd really like to start by giving you a very quick history of the fort. Um, some of you on this call today, and I know um, quite a few people in Colorado who really love Fort Garland, probably have a much more deeper and a more intimate understanding of the fort than what we're going to get into. Um, but for the rest of us, I just want to touch on the highlights so that we all have an understanding of what this place is. Later, um, I'll also want to diverge slightly and explain in greater, greater detail what archaeology is and how we use archaeology and the historical record in concert to understand the past. Fort Garland was established in 1858, and it was named for General John Garland, who was the commander of the Military District of New Mexico. It's not a single building like Bent's Fort, but it's a series of adobe buildings that served as a proper military campus. During its life, it housed two regiments, one cavalry and one infantry. Um, and it was built in response to the abandonment of Fort Massachusetts, um, which had been constructed in 1852, but actually wasn't well located geographically, and so it was determined to be inadequate. What we see in the 1850s across the American West is the establishment of military fortifications that replaced the trading posts and forts that served a variety of functions on the American frontier. Um, like Fort Massachusetts, Fort Garland, um, and a series of other forts in the American West, they were all established in the years after the end of the Mexican-American War, um, which culminated in the acquisition of over 500,000 square miles of territory by the United States from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. Um, and so this series of forts is an attempt by the United States government to build a physical presence and actually physically occupy the Western territories um, to a much greater degree than they had ever done previously. So while vast amounts of New Mexico were annexed as American soil, many of the people who lived in those areas, uh, specifically Mexican and Hispano peoples, they were still seen as foreigners and viewed as potential threat to these Western settlements. Additionally, the United States government was fully in the throes of Manifest Destiny, a project of occupying and settling a region that already had indigenous populations that called it home. Um, Namely, there were many Native American tribes in Colorado, such as the Ute and the Apache, 
So Fort Garland was really established to deal with these dual threats, Mexicans and Indians, and to control the region of the San Luis Valley, providing protection to Euro-Americans who were coming to settle here. This type of military protection for civilian settlements became increasingly important to the US government with the advent of various laws to promote settlement, such as the 1862 Homestead Act. Um, one of the things that I'm not gonna talk about a lot today, but I am gonna touch on is that Fort Garland has also been notable um, in that it stationed the so-called Buffalo Soldiers. Um, and they have had their own, you know, Western mystique grow around them. Um, since the 19th century. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about these African-American servicemen today, uh, but I do want to take this opportunity and just kind of reiterate some um, things I've said in the past about retiring that term Buffalo Soldier. Um, and I think given all the conversations that have been going on the last several weeks, this is really an, an apropos time. So for those of you who don't know, it was actually a derogatory term that tribes in the West developed for African-American soldiers. And it was not a term of endearment. Um, historians and others have really used this term uncritically, but African-American soldiers were performing the same functions of colonization and Indian removal that white soldiers were also performing. Um, and often they were sent into um, even more dangerous or socially tense situations, which I will touch on a, a little bit later, um, such as when African-American regiment was sent from Fort Garland to remove white settlers from the White River Reservation in the, in the 1870s. Um, so there's a lot of complicated history at Fort Garland. There's a, a lot of things that um, went on there and a lot of different types of people who passed through those adobe walls. Um, so that really speaks to what's going on on the Western frontier in this period of time. So Fort Garland is associated uh, with two very important and kind of germinal events. In 1862, the soldiers stationed at Fort Garland were sent to New Mexico to stop the advance of the Confederacy at the Battle of Glorieta Pass. Um, for military historians and for others, this could be the subject of its own hour-long talk. Um, but suffice it to say, over a three-day battle, Confederate forces led by um, Major Pyron and Colonel Scurry out of Texas were defeated by Colonel Slew and Major John Shivington. So Shivington is familiar to many Coloradans for being the butcher of Sand Creek just two years later in 1864. And that's when he led a regiment that committed war crimes against civilian Arapaho and Cheyenne people, um, essentially massacring them. Um, even in 1862, Shivington was not a popular guy, and he was also accused of some uh, possibly illegal and definitely unethical actions at Glorieta Pass as well. Um, he also took the credit for the victory, uh, but he may not have really been the, the leader that he touted himself to be, and it, the victory um, and accolades might properly be slows. Um, but despite all of this, the Battle of Glorieta Pass is credited with ending the New Mexican campaign by the Confederacy and securing the West for the Union. Um, in that battle, nearly a quarter of the soldiers from both sides lost their lives. And after the battle, two mass graves were dug um, to bury the dead. The mass Confederate grave, which you see here, was accidentally uncovered in 1987 uh, by a private citizen in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, who was digging a basement for a new house. So the graves were excavated by the office of the New Mexico State Archaeologist. Um, and they actually had a very excellent exhibit on this just a few years ago at the New Mexico State Museum. Um, and you can find a lot of information on their website, um, as well as at their facilities in New Mexico on this battle and on the archaeology that was done here. Um, it is also still possible um, to find the site of Glorieta Pass. So we're going to have a, a quick cuteness break here. Um, so last April when I was coming back from a conference in Albuquerque, um, I took a little detour and I do what apparently us old archaeologists do best and that is drag my poor unsuspecting family along with me to, to see these things. Um, there's not much to see here. Uh, there's a lot of trees and a large fence. It's, it's right up against National Park Service land. 
um, and they're the stewards of it and it's it's not accessible um, but there is a a marker and you really get the sense of how rugged this area was and the difficulties not only of the three days of fighting that um, these men would have undergone but also the the difficulty and the logistics of getting there in the first place and so um, leading up to the battle there's descriptions of what's essentially forced marches of some of the regiments out of Denver as well as the um, soldiers out of Fort Garland who really had to move quickly to get there in time for the battle. The other event that's widely associated with Fort Garland is the Meeker incident. Um, so in 1879, Nathaniel Meeker was serving as the Indian agent at the at White River, um, and he was wildly unpopular. He was accused of corruption and abuse by the Utes at the time, um, and unfortunately, their complaints went unheeded. Um, so eventually, this conflict with Meeker resulted in Meeker's death. Um, along with the killing of 10 other male employees and the capture of several women and children, including Meeker's wife and daughter. Um, originally, soldiers from Fort Steele in Wyoming, which is geographically closer than Fort Garland, were sent to White River to assist Meeker, uh, but they were ambushed by the Utes. Um, so ultimately, a regiment of black soldiers stationed at Fort Garland were called out to help defend the white population and the soldiers. The Meeker incident was the final excuse for the removal of the Utes from Colorado, um, with the Ucompagre and White River Utes relocated to Utah, and the holdings of the Southern Ute reduced, and all the Ute bands restricted to a small reservation by 1881. Um, this final removal of the Utes uh, essentially ended what the United States saw as the Indian Wars in Colorado, and so Fort Garland was no longer necessary and was disbanded in 1883. So while these events have uh, been glorified in some ways in Western Americana and kind of have this, this tinge of excitement to them, the reality of everyday life at the fort for the soldiers stationed here um, would have been relatively monotonous, focused on activities such as training and drilling. Most soldiers were stationed at Fort Garland on their way to other installations, and officers and commandants were usually short timers, so they were putting in their details so they could be promoted to more promising locales or to better positions. So, the question I ask publicly in all my talks, why archaeology? Um, if we know so much about Fort Garland or these other historic sites around Colorado, um, and it only existed for a, a relatively short period of time recently and has recorded historic records, like why are we bothering to do archaeology here? Archaeology encompasses two important aspects of historical scientific inquiry. The first is it is a set of anthropological questions about people, um, who people were and what their lives were like. And secondly, archeology span is a method of collecting data to answer those questions. So as I've said before, and some of you have probably heard ad nauseum, um, archeology span is really at its best when it's asking questions and collecting data about people who would not or could not leave written records about themselves or who didn't leave much about themselves, who weren't the primary focus of the documentary record. Those questions can change over time as new theories or paradigms are applied to old sites or to legacy artifact collections, kind of what we're seeing here at Fort Garland. The Colorado Historical Society, now History Colorado, acquired Fort Garland in the 1940s. And while some of the buildings were still standing, not all of the buildings were. So there was a considerable state of disrepair to the adobe. Um, the society was also faced with how to interpret the site and what stories to tell from that period. There is some evidence that archeology span may have been conducted at Fort Garland in the 60s and 70s by the Colorado Historical Society, 
um, again, with fleeting documentary records, I have found references to this, uh, but records, the boxes of artifacts that they may or may not have collected, um, we don't seem to have in our um, possession anymore. Um, but if they did, it appears that they were really looking to answer uh, research questions about the fort itself, what it looked like, how it was laid out and constructed, um, all in an effort to improve the accuracy and interpretation of the grounds when historians at the Historical Society couldn't find information in the historical record. And so this was pretty typical of early to mid 20th century archaeology. Um, historical archaeology, specifically of forts, often focused on getting enough data for what they thought were accurate reconstructions for historical displays. Um, that's not something that we do anymore for a number of reasons. Um, just the nature of archaeology actually does not always provide the appropriate information to reconstruct a fort or any other structure. Um, and also in, in some ways we have moved beyond that as um, appropriate research questions and in, in a, what we consider to be an appropriate product of doing archaeology. Um, we try to stay away from this, you know, Disneyfication of recreating historical sites um, instead of talking about other ways to commemorate or interpret them. As you get into the 1990s and through today, um, the research interests change and there's an interest in understanding the lived experiences of everyday people. Um, something that archaeology really is in a unique position to inform us about. So while there are inherent biases in the historical record, for the most part everyone left trash behind. And people's trash doesn't lie. Um, it wasn't manipulated to leave a particular viewpoint or image for subsequent people. For Fort Garland, there are many groups of people that archaeology can help illuminate and help shed a light on their everyday lives. Um, you know, as we've already stated, everything from the soldiers leading a monotonous life to civilians who are support staff and the families that accompanied their soldier husbands and fathers to the frontier. Most of the archaeology that was conducted at Fort Garland was done first in the 1990s by the Historical Society. And then from 2006 to 2012 by professors and students at Adams State. And in both cases, uh, the excavations led by Ann Bond and the excavations led by Richard Goddard, they were asking questions and recovering objects about the everyday life of people. Um, and what they found really fits into a larger pattern of material culture that we're seeing across the globe um, during the 19th century. So first, um, probably not all that surprisingly, the archaeology recovered information about Fort Garland as a military site. Um, and that isn't all that surprising, as I said, but lost in the soil around the adobe buildings were a number of common military items, such as uniform insignias. Both infantry and cavalry, excuse me, both infantry and cavalry were stationed at Fort Garland. And so we recovered these insignias, um, such as the types of symbols that would be found on a slouch hat, for instance. Um, and we also have items that were pretty iconic for their time. Um, this pin, um, I don't really have a pointer. Um, the pin in the upper left is from an 1858 hardy hat. Um, it's a black felt army dress hat, um, and it was used to pin the side of the brim. The side of the brim pinned, plus the color cordage, denoted which branch of service the wearer was enrolled in. We also have items that speak to the experiences of the soldiers. For instance, um, the medal in the middle signifies that the wearer served on the Mexican border. So troops from Fort Garland were not sent south. So whoever earned and subsequently lost this medal had probably served on the Mexican border prior to being stationed at Fort Garland and may have been part of one of the New Mexico regiments that was sent to the San Luis Valley. We also have artifacts that speak to the daily toil of the soldiers or others on the military fort. Um, 
So the, the final picture in that top row is uh, the fragment of a curry comb, which is a, a horse brush. And horses were also stationed at Fort Garland during this time and would have been a really important part of life at the fort as well. What people don't always think about is that the fort was also a domestic site. Um, and in some ways, this makes sense. Fort Garland, like all military forts, uh, was a place that specifically trained soldiers to be ready for conflict situations. Um, but those men also lived there. And when they weren't on duty or, you know, weren't soldiers, they also had private lives that were encompassed by those adobe walls. What was challenging to common ideas about the archaeological assemblage of a military fort would look like was kind of this variety and amount of domestic items. Um, not only for a military fort, but just a high volume of domestic items for any site or fort on the 19th century frontier. Um, one of the first things that I noticed that really popped out to me in Anne Bond's notes from the 90s is her excitement and surprise at all the domestic items that she was recovering from the excavation units. And so some of these domestic items include the kinds of daily items we might imagine. Utilitarian items, such as a pocket knife, uh, personal items, such as this very dapper mustache brush. Um, and of course, recreational items like checkers, chess pieces, um, and we've even recovered this fragment of a harmonica. So we begin to get a picture of how the men were entertaining themselves throughout their time at Fort Garland. There was also a number of alcohol bottles recovered, um, including glass champagne bottles and stoneware ale bottles. In many ways, uh, these items help us begin to reconstruct the hierarchy that would have existed in the 19th century military and can be really indicative of class distinctions at the fort. Um, so while the British had been exporting ales and porters all over the globe as early as the 18th century, lagers, which was more commonly drank in America, weren't stable enough to be bottled and shipped um, until the 1870s. Um, and there was actually a, a process that Adolphus Bush from now the Anheuser-Busch Company um, started that allowed for bottled beer to be shipped widely. Um, add to that kind of the logistical hardships of exporting any goods to the frontier and across the West, the enlisted men would have had to have been content with either hard alcohol, um, such as rye whiskey shipped from Missouri, um, which we see a portion of a bottle fragment in the upper right, um, or ale available from the sutler, the general store on campus, on campus, yeah, on campus, um, or homebrew, um, either from themselves or from the local community who was trading it onto the fort. Um, champagne, which there were quite a number of champagne bottles, would have been a luxury item for the officers. Um, it is important to note, however, that champagne bottles did not exclusively hold champagne. So um, sometimes you have to to complicate your ideas of, of what a particular style of bottle held. Other items that were, were recovered that begin to kind of flush out the story of class structure has to do with diet. The rations at Fort Garland were miserable. They were generally salt pork and bread. Um, however, there were a large percentage of butchered cattle remains recovered. Um, and this is really indicating that at least some of the people stationed there, probably officers, had access to foodstuffs and luxury items outside side of the military allotments. And again, this may point to greater trade between the soldiers and the local communities. Um, and that relationship is something we don't really understand very well yet. So the domestic items recovered cannot be associated only with the soldiers who lived at the fort. Um, and this is really where it starts to get interesting. Um, the artifacts shown are all from Fort Garland. However, we have not recovered complete corsets. And so the corsets in that top row are indicative of different styles of corset uh, that were all contemporaneous to the Victorian era. 
um, we're seeing really conventional types of female artifacts, you know, such as these stays and boning from the corsets, um, as well as other fragments of corset construction. Um, corsets don't necessarily tell us a lot about the women who lived in Fort Garland. They just tell us that women lived there. Um, but they were a common piece of clothing associated with all classes of Victorian women and would have been worn even by um, lower classes or laboring classes who are performing um, agricultural duties or other, other heavy labor such as washing. We also see personal items from women. Um, such as this earring in the lower left corner um, in decorated china for dining. So women served a variety of functions at Fort Garland. Wives and mothers would not just have been caretakers of their husbands and families, but would have been active members of the fort and serving the more domestic needs of the men stationed there. Um, for instance, a diary of a cavalryman's wife, Mrs. Eveline Alexander, recorded that she served in the hospital. Um, she read to infirm men. She also recorded that she took part in a gift distribution to the youths. Um, although once you really get into the description of the gifts and the items that they were, you know, so kindly giving to the youths, um, it really indicates that she was being part of this distribution of some goods that were owed to the youths by treaties and other agreements. And so it's interesting to see women being involved in these, uh, building these political relationships with the tribal groups at the time. And where there are women, women there are usually inevitably children. Um, one of the striking things about the Fort Garland collection is the large number of children's toys, both for boys and for girls. During the Victorian era, toys would have been strongly segregated between genders, although they're not that different than toys that children play with today. Um, marbles, believe it or not, even my now six-year-old asked for some for Christmas. Um, jacks, baby dolls for girls, uh, toy guns, and military figurines for boys. So, you know, just as today, you know, this gender division in toys was meant to teach children, even on the frontier, their proper roles in society and the activities that they should be pursuing. Um, and these children's toys are not actually that unusual or unique to Fort Garland. Um, in the late 1970s, Fort Bowie in Arizona was excavated and a number of toys identified there as well. So Fort Bowie was a contemporary of Fort Garland, um, dating from 1862 to 1894. So it's part of the same series of Western military installations that are being established to really occupy the West. And many of the same toys that are seen in the Fort Garland collection are also seen in the Fort Bowie collection. It's also really important to note that the work Goddard and his students have done on children's toys is important for archeological inquiry. So our models of past behavior in society still in 2020 often emphasize the activities of young to middle-aged men. Uh, children in particular are often overlooked in the archeological record. And even when they are present, their play and experiences can be under theorized or dismissed as secondary. Um, what some of uh, Goddard's students did, like um, Jamie Devine and Delphine Weiss, was to look at children as active agents within the Fort Garland site. One of the ways that Devine analyzed this uh, was through the spatial distribution of children's artifacts across the site and how that correlated for her to the range of play experienced by children. This original model for range of play was developed by archaeologist Jane Baxter, um, who's really devoted a significant portion of her career to understanding um, children and this domestic sphere that's often overlooked. Um, for Baxter, it's largely dependent on domestic space with active parental permissions as to how far a child could range and under what circumstances. 
So Devine found that this could not be directly adopted for the fort, as she theorized the fort as this extended household. So instead of just having the nuclear family, there's a large number of adults present throughout the fort, which helped increase the range that children could be unsupervised from their primary caregiver, um, typically their mother. Devine did find that the ranges allowed for play were different for girls and boys, with boys' toys found further from the domestic spaces than for girls' toys. So boys were given wider range of, of the fort and of outer areas, whereas girls were expected to stay closer to home. But the idea of where those boundaries of home were, were a little bit more fluid at the fort. Um, so what does this all mean? You know, or is it just a kinder, gentler view of military life? Um, is Fort Garland unique in the presence of women and children in this domesticated life in the material culture? Um, and what I would argue, and I think the other folks whose work I'm drawing on would argue, is no. Um, and in fact, as I pointed out earlier, we see the same artifact assemblage at other historic fort sites. So Fort Garland is actually very typical of a 19th century military installation on the frontier. But pulling back and placing Fort Garland in a context larger than the San Luis Valley or larger than Colorado, we start to see how the Victorian middle class family was integral to the colonization process. Bringing wives and families brought moral order to the frontier. The presence of women and children in a place like Fort Garland was twofold. First, allowing wives and families to accompany soldiers, particularly officers, meant that ideals of appropriate sexual and marriage partners could be upheld. Um, in Victorian society, the mother was thought of as the moral center of the nuclear family, and she was responsible for ensuring that all the members of the family adhered to their strict gender and class roles. The presence of white middle class women may have dissuaded not only their own middle class husbands from inappropriate relations with either the Hispano or the indigenous community, but it also meant that they could potentially be a moralized, morally stabilizing force for the enlisted men um, whose moral aptitude was thought to be much weaker than, than their officers under whom they served. The other role the Victorian middle class women played was as harbingers of culture. So not only were they educating their children on their cultural values through the toys, through wearing proper corsets and dress, um, through having proper dinnerware. Um, So they're not only educating their children on their cultural values, as we see through the toys, um, in the spatial distance, and what is appropriate for girls and boys and where to range, um, military forts at this time served to support and reinforce the colonial project of the surrounding civilian community. So mothers and women also brought these cultural values to the frontier to be imposed on those civilian communities that were developing and that perhaps weren't middle class and Victorian enough yet to be fully American. Just as the crossed sabers on a slate blue slouch hat very clearly signified to the community that a man was a soldier and more specifically belonged to the cavalry, the wearing of appropriate dress, such as bustles and corsets, and the use of floral decorated china and appropriately decorated dessert forks, signified to the surrounding community that the trappings of civilization could conquer the West. Family units, uh, whether they were military or civilian, were central to the colonization process. So conquering armies may devastate a landscape, but they eventually return home. Military installations such as Fort Garland were coupled with other programs, such as the 1862 Homestead Act, which was the first legislation that recognized women as individual landowners and allowed them to claim land on their own. Um, what's really interesting about this is at the time it was argued by Congress um, that passing this legislation allowing women to be Western landowners would make some women more desirable marriage partners and actually encourage the type of family formation that was ideal 
Um, and there's some data to support that this prediction turned out to be true. Um, so for instance, a majority of single women who made claims in the Nebraska territory were actually married prior to proving up their claims. And proving up a claim under the 1862 Homestead Act was a five-year process. So this process is not just playing out in the San Luis Valley. As I said earlier, this kind of artifact assemblage is seen at mid to late 19th century sites across the globe. Um, in many ways, the Victorian middle class is epitomized in the United Kingdom um, as seen throughout the Anglo world. Um, and it's really the first truly globalized process of acculturation. We see the same artifact distributions on domestic sites and on these types of military installations um, in the East Coast of the United States, in British Canada, in West Africa, and in India. Um, and we also see the same adherence to Victorian ideals of gender and class. And these cultural ideas were an incredibly powerful force, um, one that I really cannot overstate. Um, and in fact, my favorite archaeological example of just how enduring Victorian norms were is the experience of the Donner Party in 1846. Um, so again, this is one of those um, glorified stories that, that everyone seems to know, but actually really don't understand. Um, so as many of you know, the Donner Party had started off too late in the season and they were trapped in the deep snow in the Sierra Nevadas. Eventually, rations ran out, um, and in particular, the men started dying first. Um, they were dying of starvation, as well as exhaustion from exertion in trying to keep the rest of the party alive and trying to get them out of this camp for the winter. There were a number of children in that party, um, and it became the sole purpose of the mothers on that expedition um, for those children to survive. So first, survivors ate their dogs and other pack animals, um, and eventually the, the salacious part of the story that we all know, when other sources of food ran out, um, there was cannibalism. Um, but what the cannibalism was, was the mothers started feeding the men who had passed away to the children. And what the archeological investigation of those human remains has showed is that even in the face of starvation and cannibalism, the women adhered to this very strict code of Victorian conduct. The men were butchered away from the cabin where the children were sequestered. Um, and they were butchered in such a way that they were cut into proper cuts of meat and prepared similarly to pork or other meat and served around a table. Um, and these norms were adhered to so well that the children who survived the Donner Party and I think even by the time they were rescued, um, most of the, the mothers and the women of the party, most of the adults had perished. Um, but the children have denied or did deny till their dying day that cannibalism took place. They just, they were completely sheltered from it and um, never saw any of yet, yet survive this desperate situation. And I've always thought that was such an amazing story, like not only of survival, but of this you know, dogged devotion to what they considered the cultural norms. Um, so cannibalism aside, this era, the Victorian era, really shaped our present world in ways that we are still trying to grapple with and make sense of. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done at Fort Garland. Uh, Dr. Goddard is still doing his own cataloging and interpretations of excavations that he worked on for years. Um, and while there's really been significant portions of the site excavated over the last 30 years, we don't actually have a lot of written documents or work that ties this site to larger contexts in the region of the country. Um, so eventually, probably when work with the El Pueblo site is completed, um, you know, I would like us at History Colorado to move on to re-examining artifacts from Fort Garland, um, particularly the work of Anne Bond in the 90s and start to dig into some of these stories. And so many more questions remain. Um, probably the most pressing questions are around the African-American units that were stationed at Fort Garland 
and determining if we can identify their experiences separate from the white soldiers and officers. So understanding their daily experiences through material culture will really add an interesting dimension of race to the issues of class and gender um, that we've really just started to touch on by looking at the families of the officers. The biggest challenge for us, though, will be in identifying race or ethnicity in the material record and how that might manifest. Um, that can be something that's incredibly difficult, um, especially as we do know that for African American domestic sites and other parts of the country in this time period, there's also a strong reflection of Victorian middle class material. And there's not always material culture that deviates from um, white or other ethnic um, groups at this time. It'll also be important for us to be able to place Fort Garland in a more localized context and see how we can understand the interactions between the soldiers at the fort and the fort as a military institution related to the Utes and the civilian Hispano communities in San Luis. So um, I'd like to thank lots of folks. Um, Anita McDaniel, uh, Becca Simon, who I know is on this call and provided some of the cool archaeology photos, as well as all the people who've done work here at Fort Garland. Um, even though here for us today is sitting in our <laughs> sitting in our living rooms. Um, and I do have a few references um, for people who are interested in uh, some of the things that we've touched on today. So I am happy to take um, any questions or other comments that folks might have. And while we wait for questions, um, if anyone wants to, oh, sorry, there's camera in my house now. Um, if anyone wants to watch a recording of this webinar or one of our previous ones or would like to share this uh, with a friend, I'm going to put the link to our YouTube page in the chat. Cool. Huh. No questions. Um, so one of the questions is, are the middens differentiated at all? Um, I'm not familiar enough with the different uh, loci of where excavations were done to answer that. Um, my, I know a lot of the artifacts that um, I talked about today weren't actually recovered from middens. Um, there's kind of a, um, a sheet wash of artifacts out on one of the parade grounds where it looks like they were probably just dumping stuff for decades. Um, but that would be interesting to get into to see if Bond and Goddard are finding differences in middens because that might be where we start to see um, or can see um, the cavalry versus the infantry, maybe the African American soldiers um, versus the white soldiers or the officers versus the enlisted men. Thank you. He said thanks. And Holly, it looks like you have a couple questions in the Q&A box too. Thank you very much. Let's see here. So, were the Buffalo Soldiers mainly foot soldiers or cavalry too? I believe they were cavalry as well. Um, my understanding is um, that those distinctions, those distinctions didn't always matter though. So that they were kind of sent out to do um, less desirable tasks and missions than even like their fellow cavalry would have been. I know that right before she left, Anita McDaniels, who was the previous director of Fort Garland, um, redid the 
um, Buffalo Soldier exhibit there. Uh, one of the things that's always been really surprising is there's a huge lack of documentary evidence about who they were, what their lives were like, um, and kind of those experiences. So um, it'd be nice to, to dig in to see if we can find some more of that information. I'm hopeful that we don't just have to rely on archaeology and that there's still some hidden gems in different archival sources. So when I gave this uh, paper last year in, at Fort Garland, and I talked about um, that wife's diary, the Eveline Alexander, who talked about reading to the men in the infirmary and, and providing gifts to the Ute. Um, that was actually a diary that Anita and other folks at Fort Garland hadn't been aware of. And so I think that there's still a lot of potential to find out about the people who were stationed there. And then there's another question. Do you think that the nature of the accommodations for the African-American soldier is going to make it difficult to better understand their experience? Yes. Um, and I think I kind of answered that a little bit with, with what I was just saying. Um, the thing with archival evidence we have this sense that since, you know, European expansion, since we've had these imperialistic um, governments and bureaucracies, frankly, that were really, really good at keeping records, that we've got records of everything. Um, and it's really just not true. It's very, very striking, like across the globe, across colonies, across countries, um, how particular um, agents of the state were about what they did and didn't record. And so I definitely think that um, the accommodations for the African-American soldiers um, is going to make it so much more difficult to find both archival and archaeological information because um, they were, you know, we know that they were second class citizens, and so they don't show up as much in documentary records, um, and they might not show up as much in archaeology. Um, it also depends in some ways on how Bond and Goddard designed their research and how they excavated. So when you're looking for specific types of evidence um, and we find this also in like conflict sites and the sort of um, archaeology that I typically do where information or evidence can be really ephemeral. You have to from the beginning have a really solid research design with a particular methodology for how you're going to recover your data so that it doesn't all just get jumbled together. Um, so you can see things like what uh, Chris asked a couple questions ago about differentiated mittens. Um, but if that wasn't part of their research question, if their research question was about children, if their research questions you know, were about officers, um, then we might not see that in the legacy collections that are curated at History Colorado. Um, this is also a really good reason of why we typically don't excavate a site in its entirety, why you leave sites or portions of sites so that future researchers with different questions, different methods, and different tools um, can recover different types of information to provide us all with a fuller story. Okay, so another question. Were the soldiers compensated for their service in such wilderness duty by receiving land under the Homestead Act? The pay couldn't have been very substantial. Um, that's a really good question. I do know that the Homestead Act, um, while it was used successfully by some African Americans, that was really few and far between. I'm not sure that the soldiers at Fort Garland, uh, particularly the African-American soldiers, um, which you did not say specifically, but obviously that's where my brain still is, um, would have necessarily been able to receive land 
under that as um, compensation. Um, and also keep in mind that the soldiers were moved around quite a bit. So how much or how often soldiers finished out um, their duties at Fort Garland and then stuck around to be um, a settler in the San Luis Valley, I'm not sure, but I think would be a really interesting question and part of that relationship between, um, you know, the military installation and the surrounding communities. I can't tell you off the top of my head what the pay was, but no, I don't think the pay was very substantial. Um, but I think that was common to the military throughout, throughout the country. So um, I think the Homestead Act was different. How many soldiers were able to kind of leverage the Homestead Act with their experiences at Fort Garland, I'm not sure what would, would be interesting to look into. Cool beans. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone being here today and um, listening to some of my thoughts about Fort Garland and what's going on. And I think I did a much better job at uh, not keeping you over. <laughs> so um, I'm happy to stick around if anybody has any other questions or, or any other chats. Um, otherwise, uh, happy Wednesday, and I hope everybody enjoys their day. <laughs>